Um, what effect on your life did the fact that your name appeared in Woodward and Bernstein's, one of their first articles, uh, what, uh, what, what effect did that have on your life? Not pleasant. Uh, one of the very first articles named me and several other people as the recipients of the illegal fruits of the Watergate tap taping system, which wasn't true. Um, but it didn't bother me a lot because I thought that was kind of a nothing burger and who cares and so forth. But then it continued. And it did upset me then. I, I put a denial out through Ron Ziegler, the press secretary, and, and um, so I called the counsel, the president, and said, look, I'm mad. Can I sue these guys? Uh, I had nothing to do with it, didn't even know about it, and uh, been defamed, and what can I do? Oh, no, you can't do anything. He said, there's depositions, and uh, you just pay a lawyer, and you say, everything is blow over. You shouldn't get involved in it. Well, of course, the counsel was John Dean, who gave me that great advice. And clearly, he had another agenda, which I didn't know about. I couldn't have won it anywhere in the Sullivan Act, I think, but still, it, it upset me. And they never apologized for that. Uh, if you buy their book, uh, Woodward and Bernstein's book, All the President's Men, on page something 250, they admit they made a mistake in that. Uh, but there's no public, uh, to this day, apology or acknowledgement that they made a mistake. They're supposed to have two sources for everything, and all that's a bunch of baloney. So it did uh, upset me a little bit, but people forgot about it and moved on, although McGovern picked it up and ran it as a TV commercial uh, in, that, in the 72 uh, election. And I get calls from around the country, I just saw your name on television. He, so it was not pleasant. Well, sometime later, you'd be picked up by another presidential candidate and participate and, and be a figure in an election. This happened to you in this recent election. Well, but I wasn't involved in that. That's, again, uh, press. That's why they're reluctant to talk to the press. They get things so messed up. I was never involved in John McCain's campaign, never gave him a nickel of money. Uh, I voted for him and supported him uh, indirectly, but I wasn't part of the campaign. and. Uh, was kind of pillared about on that, uh, uh, going over my background and clients and the consummate insider and everything else, which is ironic in light of the people he's put in the White House. Um, back to the legislative shop, I think I'll point out that when Bryce Harlow, who was my mentor, great friend and guide and teacher, we had two members of his staff work the Senate, two members work the, the House. Uh, and that continued, uh, and eventually I got, when I became the assistant president, and after a year or so, I, the workload was so immense, I got the president to agree to three for the Senate and three for the House, so we enlarged our staff. And so we did with seven what they do now with 25. I mean, the current and the immediate past presidents have had huge legislative staff. But, you know, they were about 5,000 record votes during Nixon's term on the floors of both the Senate and the House, not counting all the votes in the committees and subcommittees, which had to be five times that or something. We probably got 100,000 letters over the course of the six years. Uh, we probably got 35,000 incoming, but you have to acknowledge them and then prepare substantive responses either to the president or from some policy office, uh, we had to comment on all the president's speeches and public statements that have any effect on Congress, the State of the Union, uh, when he sent messages to Congress, and so forth. We had to read those things and write comments to the staff secretary who sent those around to other offices, too. Telephone calls. You wouldn't believe the number of telephone calls we got. Dozens and dozens and dozens every day. And of course, Hell has no fury like a politician or a committee chairman that doesn't get his phone call returned. So we're there working all night on these things. Uh, you take all those and you consider the workload. It's just amazing to me, looking back on it, 
uh, that we've got anything done at all. I mean, we're just consumed with, with work for a small operation. Um, that doesn't mean that the current people can do it. The different ways to organize your office, some do it by policy. We did it by Senate and House. Uh, but it was humongous. We had bill signing ceremonies. We had the president take people down on the Sequoia boat, the presidential yacht. Uh, Air Force One, the president took members on. Uh, we had, uh, I had him give us uh, 30 minutes every week for to bring in the cherry blossom princess or some member wanted some person to come in and meet the president and have a picture taken. Uh, no substance was allowed in those meetings, and the president didn't like him very much. He thought it was a waste of his time, but nevertheless, uh, 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 he did it. Um, and then the leadership meeting was talking. We had breakfast. It seemed to me we had more breakfast than I can recall with leaders up on the top floor of the thing. I did an analysis during, when I was in the White House, and during his first term, he had more direct meetings with members of Congress than Lyndon Johnson did. People wouldn't think about that today. People don't know about Amtrak and the space shuttle and and uh, 18 year old vote and all volunteer army vote and Amtrak and uh, that he created the not only the OMB we've talked about but the domestic council as a pattern after the uh, National Security Council uh, Council of Environmental Quality post office department made independent uh, which caused a lot of uproar among politicians who want to always appoint the local postmaster a lot of reorganization going on we mentioned EPA. All of these things exist today, uh, and they come from the Nixon administration. So again, I want to congratulate the library and uh, for, for all the work you're doing to bring this stuff to light and let people look at the good and the bad, uh, whatever the facts and history show. When you were working on the Reagan transition, to what extent did you use the lessons from this period? Well, nothing specific, because the transition of Nixon was a little different. But the government experience itself was very helpful, how things work. What kinds of people do you need in different departments and agencies? Um, uh, Timetables. Uh, what do you do the first 100 days? Uh, what will Congress accept? What won't they accept? Uh, uh, so the experience of working in the Nixon White House was very, very helpful. Uh, there was no specific item that uh, was applicable, though, to the Reagan transition. Given what happened to the Nixon White House with all of its achievements, what was the lesson from the from, from Watergate? What could have been? I think the president, uh, after all, he won re-election overwhelmingly, and he had a mandate. And if it hadn't been for Watergate, I think he would have gone on and done great things. Clearly SALT too, which he helped negotiate but wouldn't China would have gone on and detente would have gone on so that whole thing China would have been improved more I think mm -hmm. in the second term uh, and there would have been probably more budget control uh, maybe more tax reductions to stimulate the economy uh, there have been a lot of things I think if it hadn't been for Watergate when you did read the or you didn't read it but when you learned of the smoking gun tape what were you surprised yeah. Yes. In fact, um, I'm in the staff mess with, I guess, Lynn Garment and Harry Dent, maybe. I can't remember the three of us. And I said, we can't uh, can't sustain this. And they're gonna, gonna be impeached. And he ought to consider resigning. And uh, I, of course, was a loyalist and still am, but uh, that was really devastating. What role did Mel Laird play in, in the last, in, the, in 1973? He was brought back to help you. Uh, no, no, he didn't. He was brought back to help the president. The president and but, and uh, I don't know. I think he gave him advice and counsel, and he might have gone up and talked to some people. I don't, don't know about it. He was very popular among a group of House members, particularly. <clears throat> he was a senior person. Uh, and Bryce was brought back, Bryce Harlow. So they had some heavy guns there. Did they coordinate? Would they work with you? I don't remember. I think they probably did in the sense of we want to see X, Y, and Z. Uh, do you want to come with us? you want to set it up? Here's what we're going to say. Uh, 
I'm guessing some of that I don't remember specifically. Do you remember any specifics about the fight over the Jackson Bannock Amendment? Yeah. Uh, the Jackson Bannock Amendment to a most favored nation uh, trade agreement that that uh, Jackson would not approve until the Soviet Union allowed Jews to immigrate uh, uh, to Israel, I guess, and uh, they were being persecuted something fierce in those days, and, and Scoop Jackson was very adamant that nothing be done to further relations with the Soviet Union unless they agreed to this immigration. So as I recall, that was the Jackson Vanek yes. Amendment, and, uh, and the President agreed uh, with it, I think, uh, best I can recall. Um, uh, do you, when you were involved in the Nixon transition, do you recall that uh, Scoop Jackson was considered for mm -hmm. the post of Secretary of Defense? Mm -hmm. There was some talk of it. I'm not, I, I, I didn't talk to the President-elect about it, but there was talk in the Pierre Hotel up there about Scoop Jackson being Secretary of Defense. Was there a difference in your work from when the change, when there was a change from Haldeman to Haig? Did that make a difference in? No, I knew Al Haig quite well because we had adjoining offices and and uh, uh, they both were quite uh, uh, precise uh, and they're both loyal to the president. Uh, so there was no big change, uh, particularly. I, I hated the circumstances of, of Bob Haldeman and John Ehrlichman leaving. Uh, but no, uh, we got along good with Egg, and he understood our role and included me in things that I should have been included in. We've interviewed John Lehman. Did, uh, did you, was he one of those sort of assistants who worked with you and would, would consult with you on, on the sort of national security implications? Yes, yes. National Security Council, very helpful, uh, smart, uh, and was immensely helpful in those days. And I don't think he had an independent agenda to go to the Hill kind of on his own. If, if he had to go up, he would talk to us about it and everything else. Unlike Henry Kissinger, who did a lot of things on the Hill and never told us about it. <clears throat> well, the, those, the classified briefings of the small group of uh, congressional leaders, they would be done by Kissinger, not you. Correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. So, and you were or, not. Or maybe Haig. I mean, I don't know, but not me. And you would not necessarily be told what that's right. what they were briefed on. That's right. Didn't that make your? Didn't that complicate your job? Well, it did. But I mentioned the workload we had there. I mean, uh, to carve out time for that, it just uh, would have been incredibly difficult. Although it's important, obviously, but other people could do the job better. National Security Council people or Defense people or wherever they on, on all, all that. So you can't be involved in everything. Um, which brings up another point is that Bryce Harlow instituted a sit-in in, in the Republican leader's office an hour every week in the House and another hour in the Senate Republican leader's office. And I would go with him to the House side and Ken Ballou would go in the Senate side and after he left I continued that process where you sit there and have the leader schedule members in who face to face complaint time and uh, sit there with them every week uh, and listen to what they had take notes and try to get back to them on their issues which was a release for them I think but the time involved was incredible so all of these things take time out of other things that perhaps should have been done um, what was the uh, difference for you in the shift from President Nixon to President Ford? Well, uh, sad, I guess. It was a sad time uh, uh, to see President Nixon uh, depart under those circumstances. Uh, I was never particularly close to him in the sense of a bond. I was much closer to Gerald Ford, actually, because he was the Republican leader, and I kind of lived in his office for a while and knew him back when I worked in the Congress. Uh, and his personality was different than President Nixon, so he was easy to get to know and talk to. And uh, he named me, I think, the first holdover to stay publicly, press release, out of the press room, um, primarily for continuity of the legislative program, not because of me personally. Um, so, uh, and we got along well. I had, uh, uh, 
he was very easy to talk to, very accessible. Uh, President Nixon was not that easy to talk to. And if you had to see him, uh, you could, but you better make sure you had something that was worthy of his time. Was it difficult to get him to make calls to Congressman? Ford? No, President Nixon. Uh, yeah, we, we were able to do that. We would submit call sheets and talking points. And he did some. He wasn't happy with that. It's like the Cherry Blossom Princess thing. He wasn't happy s spending his time with that. But he did some, particularly when he felt it was really important. There was an issue at stake. And, uh, and he did make some calls. Not a lot. I think not as much as Ford did, obviously. Uh, sure. But, uh, you know, President Nixon served in the House served in the Senate, eight years vice president, presiding over the Senate. Uh, uh, he knew what made him tick. And uh, for people to say he was isolated and didn't know what Congress, that's baloney. He knew him quite well, probably too well. <laughs> and, um, but he would make calls, yeah, and write notes occasionally on his own. We would submit some, uh, but he would write. Mr. Timmons, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you, gentlemen. You're welcome. Can we give room tone just sure. like 10 seconds of that? Sure. Okay, I'm going to slate it. I'm going to say room tone, and we'll be quiet after that. Room tone. Thank you.